Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Colorectal Cancer Screening and Prevention in High-Risk Individuals. The topics that will be covered tonight are paramount to our community. As many as 90% of the millions of people who have an inherited mutation that causes or predisposes them to cancer are unaware of their risk. Join us in spreading awareness to your friends and family and shine the light on hereditary cancer to save lives. My name is Elise Boucher. I'm a member of the FORCE community and I will be your moderator for this evening. FORCE improves the lives of millions of individuals and families facing hereditary breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, and endometrial cancers. Our community includes people with a BRCA, ATM, PALB2, CHECK2, or other inherited gene mutations and those diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. We accomplish the FORCE mission through our education, support, advocacy, and research efforts. No matter your inherited mutation or diagnosis, FORCE and our trained volunteers are available to help. Visit our website for expert-reviewed information and access to our support programs, including virtual Zoom meetings, our peer navigation matching program, and our online message boards. At this time, we would like to recognize our sponsors for making this programming possible and for their continued support of FORCE and the hereditary cancer community. Our presenter tonight is Bryson Katona, MD, PhD. Dr. Katona is a physician scientist whose clinical practice and research program are both focused on hereditary, hereditary gastrointestinal cancer risk syndromes. Dr. Katona is currently an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. He serves as a director of the gastrointestinal cancer genetics program as well as the director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Preventer Risk Evaluation Program at the University of Pennsylvania. After his presentation, we will conduct a Q&A to answer the many questions that you sent us. We will do our best to address each one. Dr. Katona will not be providing medical advice this evening. Please reach out to your doctor if you have any specific or urgent questions. Dr. Katona, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, come speak today about a topic that I think is extremely important and is a topic that it, I feel very passionate about. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come talk. Um, so these are my disclosures, uh, none of which are pertinent to any of the information that I will go over today. And as an additional disclosure, I would just like to uh, point out that uh, this is an informational webinar and that any information I will provide today really should not substitute for recommendations provided by your, your medical team. So the objectives that I'd like to cover today are, are threefold. First, uh, by the end of this talk, hopefully you'll be able to understand the risk of colorectal cancer uh, for average risk individuals, as well as for those at increased risk. Second, I hope that you'll be able to describe risk factors for developing colorectal cancer. And then third, I'd like you to be able to recognize different methods for colorectal cancer screening and how they should be applied, both to individuals at average risk as well as to those who are at, are at increased risk. And so here's an overview of the talk. So first, we'll start out going through a little bit of colorectal cancer epidemiology. Uh, second, we'll then move on to some risk factors for colorectal cancer. Third, methods for colorectal cancer screening. And then finally, how these colorectal cancer screening recommendations can be applied to uh, high-risk individuals. So let's first start with some colorectal cancer epidemiology. So colorectal cancer is incredibly common. Uh, if you look at new cases of cancer within the United States, colon cancer is the third most common cause of cancer in both men and women. And additionally, if you look at uh, new cancer deaths or cancer deaths, um, you'll also note that colorectal cancer is the third most common cause of cancer-related death in both men and women. And when we think about the average risk population, the overall lifetime risk of developing colon cancer is about 5% over the course of a lifetime. Now, there are significant disparities that exist in colorectal cancer incidence and mortality. And so here we have colon cancer incidence, and here we have colon cancer mortality. And what you can see here, and these are, these are different rates for incidence and mortality, and you can see that colon cancer occurs more commonly in men than in women. And additionally, uh, colon cancer is more often uh, fatal in men 
men and women. Additionally, we see some disparities with regard to race and ethnicity. Uh, you can see here that in terms of incidence, individuals identifying as non-Hispanic uh, Black have an increased incidence as well as mortality compared to those who identify as other races and ethnicities. Now, colorectal cancer incidence and mortality is definitely decreasing. And if you look here over the last century or so, what you can see here is that male mortality and female mortality has both, are both decreasing, especially over the last couple decades. Uh, when you look at incidence, which is how frequently the cancer is found, again, those rates are substantially decreasing over the last couple of decades. And these decreases that you're seeing over the last couple of decades are likely all related to one, increased therapies for colon cancer, but then two, the increasing use of colon cancer screening which certainly can prevent both colon cancer incidence as well as colon cancer mortality. Now, one subgroup where we're not seeing a decrease in colon cancer incidence is in young people. So if you look at individuals age 65 and older and those age 50 to 64, what you can see that over the last couple of decades, most of the time during which we have been doing colon cancer screening, the colon cancer incidence have, has really been decreasing over that time period. However, when you look at the younger demographic, those between ages 20 to 49, what you can see here is that it's actually, we're seeing an increase in colon cancer incidence. And this is certainly a, a, a fair, fairly alarming finding. However, one important point to note about this data is that uh, the y-axis here, so the rate is actually much, much lower still, even though it's increasing for young individuals compared to those who are uh, of older age. And a final point I want to point out here for uh, colon cancer epidemiology is that if colorectal cancer is found early, people do incredibly well. And so if you look at survival after the diagnosis of colorectal cancer, if you have localized disease, your survival rates are near 90%. So meaning that if it's caught very early, uh, your chances of long-term survival are very, very good. However, with people who have metastatic colorectal cancer, those five-year survivals are much lower, uh, all under 20%. And so this basically uh, shows that for colorectal cancer, if you can catch it early, uh, people are gonna do much, much better. And so that further emphasizes the importance of colorectal cancer screening. All right, so let's move on and let's uh, move on to talk about risk factors for colorectal cancer. And so there are many, many different risk factors uh, that are out there that can increase or decrease one's risk of developing colorectal cancer. So there are behavioral factors, family history, and genetic risk syndromes. And we'll go through each of these categories in a little bit more detail throughout this talk. Um, there are other factors as well, and I don't have time to go through all of these, but I'll just uh, briefly mention that other medical conditions can change the risk of colorectal cancer, such as individuals with inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, it's also been uh, postulated that the microbiome, which refers to the bacteria that lives in, your, in the large intestines of all of us, uh, may have a significant uh, impact on col colorectal cancer risk as well. But I'll really primarily for the purposes of this talk, really just focus on the first three topics. So let's first uh, talk about behavioral factors that may increase colorectal cancer risk. So there are many things that will influence the risk and both increase the risk as well as decrease the risk. And many of these slides will have uh, a term on here called relative risk. And so for relative risk, you can think of average risk is one. And so if it's above one, that's an increase in risk. So 1.2 would be about a 20% risk. And if it's below one, that means it's a decreased risk. So a 0.7 is about a 30% decreased risk. Um, and so factors that can increase risk of colorectal cancer include alcohol consumption. And uh, essentially this is proportional to the number of drinks. So the more drinks uh, an individual has on the course of a day, the higher the colorectal cancer risk. Other factors that influence risk are obesity, uh, red meat consumption, processed meat consumption, and then a prior history of smoking. 
And what you can notice is, is that these all increase the risk a little bit. So, you know, 20%, 30%, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, each one individually does not increase the risk all that much. However, together, they can make a substantial uh, difference in your colon cancer risk. There are behavioral factors that decrease risk, such as physical activity and dairy consumption. There's also some data out there showing that a diet high, high in, in fruits and vegetables uh, may also decrease the risk as well. Now, how about familial and genetic risk, and how does that affect colon cancer risk? Well, this is a, a diagram that was first published about uh, 20 years ago or so, and has been used in a million presentations since then. And what it shows is that probably about a quarter or so of colon cancers are thought to be due to either familial risk or due to a known hereditary syndrome. Back then in, in, the two, in, in 2000, about 20 years ago, it was thought that hereditary syndromes made up about 2 to 3 percent of all colorectal cancers. However, we're getting much better at identifying hereditary syndromes and doing testing to identify these syndromes. And therefore, we think that this percentage for hereditary syndromes is probably closer to 5 to 6 percent of colorectal cancers are due to a hereditary syndrome. Most commonly, this is due to Lynch syndrome. However, the second most common is a condition called familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP. Now, we'll next spend a little bit of time talking about each of these two, familial risk and genetic risk. We'll try to talk about those uh, separately. So first, let's think about familial risk. So familial risk for colorectal cancer really is uh, dependent on the number of colon cancers in the family and the age at which those colon cancers are diagnosed. So if we say that at baseline, our risk is about one here, if you have a first degree relative, so this means a parent or a sibling or a child with colon cancer, it essentially doubles your colon cancer risk. If that individual was diagnosed with a very young colon cancer, say for example, under age 45, that risk is even further increased. And if you have more than one close relative with colon cancer, that risk is even further increased. So in terms of family risk, you can think of the more family members you have who are affected, and the younger the ages of diagnosis, that will lead to increased risk of colon cancer. Now we also have known genetic risk as, as well. And uh, of the genetic syndromes, uh, Lynch syndrome really is the highest risk and, and most common uh, colon cancer syndrome uh, that, that we deal with. And so Lynch syndrome can be caused by five different genes, and there's a range of different colorectal cancer risks. Uh, MLH1 and MSH2 and EPCAM really are the higher risk genes, and as you can see, those are associated with higher lifetime risks of colorectal cancer. MSH6 and PMS2 are associated with slightly lower risks of colon cancer, and although lower than the higher risk Lynch syndrome genes, they're still substantially above the general population risk of about 5%. Now, some other hereditary syndromes that have substantially increased risk of colorectal cancer include familial adenomatous polyposis, which is called FAP. It's due to a gene mutation in the APC gene. Um, individuals that have the classic version of this disease basically have 100% risk of colorectal cancer if their colon is not surgically removed. Um, and those with a less severe attenuated form have a slightly lower but still an incredibly high risk of colorectal cancer. There are many other genes out there where there are significantly increased risk of colorectal cancer, in, including individuals who carry two copies of the MUTYH gene called MUTYH-associated polyposis, individuals with Poit-Jager syndrome, Juvenile polyposis syndrome, Cowden syndrome, and Lee Fraumeni syndrome also have substantially increased risk of colorectal cancer. However, there are some uh, moderate risk genes as well that are imp important to point out. Uh, one of those is a gene called APCI1307K, which is found very commonly in individuals with Ashkenazi Jewish descent, probably in about 5 to 10 percent of these individuals, and can lead to a doubling of colon cancer risk. Uh, additionally, there is a gene called CHECK2, which we find in about 1 to 2 percent of individuals, which also can lead to about a doubling of colon cancer risk. Uh, 
And then finally, uh, not all genes are associated with increased colon cancer risk. And over here on the right, I have genes that we do not think at this time are conclusively associated with an increased colon cancer risk, including BRCA1 and BRCA2, ATM and PALB2, as well as some other uh, less common genes uh, that we will sometimes find when we're doing uh, genetic testing. All right, so uh, let's go on to uh, talk about colorectal cancer screening. Um, so I'm going to get on my soapbox here and uh, talk about the term colorectal cancer screening. So I really do like colorectal cancer screening. I think it's important and it, do, and, and it definitely prevents uh, colorectal cancer death. However, I don't like the term colorectal cancer screening. Uh, in the real, in the ideal world, really we're not screening for colorectal cancers. Really, the goal of screening is to find cancers at almost a precancerous state. Um, and, and by precancerous state, I mean as a colon polyp, which can then be removed to subsequently decrease the risk of colorectal cancer forming down the road. So um, really, colorectal cancer screening is not the ideal term, but it's been around for long enough, and I think that that term is, is, is certainly going to stick moving forward. Now, if we think about colorectal cancer screening rates uh, across the U.S., uh, our long-term long goal as a country has really been to hit a colorectal cancer screening rate of about 80%. And what you can see here is that if you look across this uh, whole map of the U.S., uh, there is not one place in the U.S. that has actually hit this, this rate of 80% of individuals undergoing colon cancer screening. Uh, states in the gray have the highest rates, and so you can see up here in the, in the Northeast, uh, as well as in the upper Midwest, uh, states are doing pretty well. States in the darker green have the lowest rates, and I think the lowest rate on here is probably Wyoming out here at 58%. However, despite if you're in the higher, the best states or the states with the lower rates, uh, these rates overall are still uh, suboptimal, certainly below the, the standard of 80% that we were striving to achieve. So when do you start and stop uh, colorectal cancer screening in, in the average risk population? So if you'd asked me three or four years ago, uh, back in 2017, the answer would have been that screening should really be begin and be done between the ages of 50 and 75. Um, you can consider it between ages 76 to 85, and, and that's a very individualized decision that's based on uh, other uh, conditions or, or other uh, health issues that may be going on. And really, after age 85, colorectal cancer screening should, should not be performed. However, in, in 2018, the American Cancer Society uh, put out a real landmark paper that actually proposed lowering the age of colorectal screening cancer screening down to the age of 45. And this created a lot of uh, ripples throughout the field of uh, gastroenterology and cancer prevention uh, in general. And uh, it really started to gain hold. And, and uh, as proof of that, actually, uh, last year, the United States Preventative Services Task Force actually issued new draft recommendations, which, which have not yet been finalized but they did give uh, colorectal cancer screening in adults age 45 to 49 a grade of B, which essentially will translate into uh, screening during those uh, ages being recommended. So really now I think the age to start colorectal cancer screening in the average risk population is age 45. All right, so let's talk a little bit about colorectal cancer screening and the different methods that are, are available. So we have several different uh, categories of, of colorectal cancer screening methods, and I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail. First, we have stool-based methods. Uh, we have radiologic methods, essentially uh, methods that use a radiology type study. And then third, we have endoscopic methods. And depending on what method you use, uh, one of the big factors is, is that depending on the method, it changes the interval during which future uh, colonoscopy or colon cancer screenings uh, should be performed. But let's go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So first, uh, let's do uh, stool-based methods. And so there's three different stool-based methods that, that have been utilized, something called FOBT or fecal occult blood testing, there's something called FIT or fecal immunochemical testing, and then FIT DNA, which is known as Cologuard. Uh, 
The advantages for these stool-based methods are that one, you don't have to use any colon prep, uh, two, they don't require any anesthesia, and then three, there's really no procedural risks from undergoing the, these tests other than some people getting uh, incredibly uh, uh, grossed out by having to take a small little sample of their, of their bowel movement. Uh, disadvantages of these methods are that one, they need to be done very frequently. So typically they have to be repeated every one to three years, depending on what test you use. Um, if these tests are positive, uh, you do need to then undergo a colonoscopy. Um, and so really this is a this is, uh, this is a real must, and it's really important for people that undergo these type of colon cancer screening tests to, to know that, that if they're positive, they really need to get a colonoscopy. Um, there is limited sensitivity for detecting early colon polyps, and so it's very. This is very good for finding large polyps, and very good for also finding colon cancers. But it's not very good for finding uh, small polyps. And there's also the potential for something called a false positive, meaning that you do the stool-based test, the test comes back positive, you then get a colonoscopy, and sometimes that colonoscopy is normal. Um, in that case, you know, in the end of the day, there's. Uh, it, there's no uh, no harm done. However, that can oftentimes create some uh, uh, feelings of anxiety and, and worry, especially during that period during which you get the positive test back and when the colonoscopy is actually performed. Now let's go on to radiologic methods. So I'm going to cross out barium enema as this is more of a historical test. It's really no longer uh, recommended uh, for colon cancer screening. And I'll really just focus on uh, something called CT colonography, which is basically doing a CT scan to screen for colon cancer. The advantages of these, uh, this method is that, again, it's non-invasive. There's no anesthesia. And if it's normal, actually, for an average risk person, you can have five years between exams. The disadvantages of the CT colonography are that you do have to do a full bowel prep to totally cleanse the bowel. It does involve a, a decent amount of radiation exposure since it's a CT scan. Um, if it's positive, again, a col full colonoscopy needs to be done. And it also, similar to the stool test, doesn't help pick up the very, very small uh, early precancerous polyps. And then finally, the CT colonography has potential for what we call incidental lesions. So CT scans, of course, they're looking at the colon, but they may find a small nodule or a cyst or some other uh, finding in your belly, which then may require additional follow-up and certainly has the potential to uh, cause additional worry or, or concern, even though this finding may be of no clinical consequence. And then finally, let's talk about uh, endoscopic methods. So there are two methods. There's flexible sigmoidoscopy. Flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, anal uh, basically examines about half of your colon, whereas colonoscopy examines the full colon. The advantages for these are that they allow both detection of colon polyps um, or precancerous colon polyps, but also enable those polyps to be removed. They have the highest sensitivity for detecting polyps, and so even really, really tiny polyps can be seen and removed during the exam. And if normal, especially for a colonoscopy, you, you'll have the longest interval between exams. So for the average risk individual with a normal colonoscopy, you can repeat colonoscopy every 10 years. The disadvantages are that they do require a bowel prep to clean out the colon. They are invasive with a small risk of, of complications, and they do require anesthesia uh, as well, as these uh, procedures are, are not the most comfortable uh, things to undergo. So how effective is, is uh, colon cancer screening? I'm really going to focus on colonoscopy. Uh, I'm slightly biased being a gastroenterologist, uh, but I do think that colonoscopy really is the gold standard for colon cancer screening. Um, and so colonoscopy itself is very effective at preventing colon cancer. And so this is a large study that was called the Nurses Health Study that followed almost 90,000 individuals over a long period of time. And what they found was that colonoscopy uh, substantially reduced death from, from all colon cancer uh, by, by about 70%, and it included uh, reducing death from both proximal and distal colorectal cancer, meaning cancer from the beginning of the colon and cancer from the end of the colon, whereas you see the flexible sigmoidoscopy, which only examines about half the colon, was not effective in reducing colon cancer death from cancers in the beginning of the colon. So colonoscopy does work very well in, in preventing colon cancer-related death. 
But how do you know if you're getting a good colonoscopy? Well, there are some indicators of a, of a high quality uh, endoscopist. And one of those is something called adenoma detection rate. And this is basically the percentage of, of times a, a endoscopist will find a precancerous adenomatous polyp uh, during a colonoscopy in an average risk individual. And there's been a, some studies on this that have shown that the more polyps the gastroenterologist or the endoscopist is identifying, the lower the risk of subsequent colon, col, colorectal cancer. So if you have somebody who is finding a polyp in 40% of the cases that he or she is, is doing, compared to somebody finding a polyp in 5% of the cases that he or she is doing, uh, you certainly would want to have your colonoscopy done by the individual who's finding polyps in 40% in of the cases. Additionally, uh, there is something called withdrawal time, and this is the uh, time that it takes for the endoscopist uh, once, once to the end of the colon to come back and examine the rest of the colon on the way back. And so the longer the time they spend examining the colon, the lower the risk of subsequent uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so basically, the longer you look, the more you're going to find, and ultimately that's going to lead to colon cancer prevention down the road. So thinking about all these different methods for colorectal cancer screening, for average risk individuals, um, basically any of these methods are, are okay to do. However, if you're doing something other than a colonoscopy and that test is positive, then you really need to get a colonoscopy performed in order to confirm uh, and, and make sure that there's nothing concerning that, that resulted from that positive colon cancer screening test. For individuals at high risk, really, I would say colonoscopy should be the only test that, that is utilized. All right, so let's move on to uh, talk about colorectal cancer screening recommendations for high-risk individuals. And uh, first, we should say, who is defined as a high-risk individual? And we kind of went over this a little bit before, but those with a genetic risk syndrome, those with a personal history of either colorectal cancer or colorectal polyps, or those who have a family history of colorectal cancer or colon polyps. And we'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail. But I think, again, the point that I wanna highlight and emphasize, and uh, really for these high-risk individuals, colonoscopy really is the recommended screening tool. All right, let's uh, first start with uh, genetic risk syndromes. Um, so I'm gonna just, just use Lynch syndrome as an example here. So in, for individuals who have Lynch syndrome, uh, if they carry a mutation in the MLH1 or MSH2 or FCAM gene, it's recommended that those individuals start colonoscopy around age 20 to 25 and actually repeat colonoscopy every one to two years. For individuals with slightly lower risk genes, such as MSH6 and PMS2, it's recommended that individuals consider starting colonoscopy by 30 to 35 and again repeating every one to two years. There are other risk syndromes that are certainly associated with more frequent colonoscopy use and earlier age of colonoscopy initiation, uh, such as um, familial adenomatous polyposis or MUTYH associated polyposis, and other high risk conditions such as Poit Shagers, uh, juvenile polyposis syndrome, Cowden syndrome, and Lee Fraumani syndrome. Um, now, for uh, these particular high-risk individuals, colonoscopy is, is very, very important, and it's very important to get it done frequently. Uh, so we were very interested to see uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic affected colonoscopy uh, use uh, in these high-risk groups. And so my group recently published a report looking at COVID-19 disruptions to endoscopic surveillance in individuals with Lynch syndrome. And when we looked at the COVID, and this was actually just published uh, only about a month ago or so in, in the journal Cancer Prevention Research. And what we found is, is that during the spring of 2020, when everything shut down to, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, about 11% of, of the cohort of Lynch syndrome patients that we follow here at Penn actually had their surveillance uh, canceled due to COVID-19. We found that 85% of these patients were able to effectively reschedule within six months, but there were 15% of patients who did not have their surveillance uh, rescheduled. And we found that younger individuals were less likely to, to reschedule and also 
uh, being male was also suggestive of being less likely to reschedule. That's highlighting some uh, groups that may need uh, more outreach to make sure that we can get the, their surveillance uh, appropriately rescheduled. Now, when we get to uh, uh, some of the lower risk genes, what we'll call these the moderate risk genes, uh, these individuals also may potentially need increased colon cancer screening. And so three of the moderate risk genes that we find very, very often uh, include this APCI1307K, which is seen very frequently in individuals with Ashkenazi Jewish uh, ancestry, uh, mutations in CHECK2, which is seen in about 1% to 2% of people, as well as carriers of a single copy of the MUTYH gene, which we see in about 1% to 2% of individuals. Now, there was a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, differing recommendations about how carriers of these particular genes uh, should be managed. Um, about a year or two ago, a couple years ago, uh, I collaborated with some of our colleagues at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, as well as Dana-Farber Cancer Center, uh, really to put out a, a framework to help manage cancer risk for carriers of these three different genes. And um, what we came up with and what is uh, supported uh, now by guideline recommendations are that individuals who uh, carry this APCI1307K gene mutation or the CHECK2 mutation really should start colonoscopy or colon cancer screening earlier. And usually most of these individuals should start around age 40. And if colonoscopy is normal, to repeat every five years. However, we also found that uh, MUTYH carriers, or those that have a single copy of this gene, really at this time there is not sufficient evidence to show that these carriers of a single copy of the MUTYH gene uh, should, be, should undergo more frequent colon cancer screening. And so for these individuals, we don't use the mutation uh, to determine colon cancer screening recommendations. We base it instead on personal and family history. And then finally, uh, when thinking about uh, genetic risk syndromes, uh, we have the list of genes that, are, that have not conclusively been associated with increased colorectal cancer risk, including BRCA1 and BRCA2, ATM, and PALB2. Um, so in this case, um, there's been some, uh, been kind of a smattering of different reports, um, but, but overall, uh, the literature has not been conclusive enough to show that any of these genes are associated with increased uh, uh, colon cancer risk. And uh, given a lot of the uncertainty in this area, uh, we did uh, publish a paper uh, discussing this topic in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute uh, with Susan Domchek, who runs our Vassar Center for BRCA here at Penn, as well as two of our colleagues from Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, really highlighting that uh, especially for BRCA1 and 2 mutations, that really the data does not support uh, screening more aggressively for colorectal cancer at this time. And for all of these gene carriers, really colorectal cancer screening should be based on the personal as well as the family history of colon cancer and or colon polyps. All right, so um, let's also look at a couple other high-risk groups. So let's, let's think about individuals who have a personal history of colorectal cancer. For individuals who have a personal history of colorectal cancer, it's recommended that uh, one year after the colon cancer is diagnosed, that those individuals should have a repeat colonoscopy. And if that's negative, it should then be repeated in five years. And if that's negative, it should then be repeated at least every five years. And so this is having a personal history of colon cancer in individuals who have had negative genetic testing for any of the high-risk cancer syndromes. Now, we can also think about personal history of colon polyps. And what we know about this is that if individuals uh, who, again, this is in the absence of having a, a known hereditary risk syndrome, uh, but if individuals have a history of, a, of colon polyps, the interval for repeating colon cancer screening is really based on the type of polyp, the number of polyp, and the size of polyps. And so the more polyps you have, uh, the larger the size of the polyps, or depending on the type of the polyp, so basically how they look under the microscope, these are all factors that may decrease the interval uh, that colon cancer screening is, is performed. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about family history of colorectal cancer or colon polyps. Again, this is in for families that, that don't have a known uh, high-risk colon cancer genetic syndrome. 
And so for this, we'll, we'll talk about first degree relatives. And by first degree relative, I'm gonna say that is a parent, a child, or a sibling. And for first degree relatives that have an advanced colon adenoma, meaning a, a precancerous polyp of the colon that is either large in size or again, has some kind of advanced features under the microscope. These individuals should really start, um, sorry, um, individuals that have a first degree relative with one of these advanced adenomas should start colonoscopy earlier, usually around by age 40 or so, and should repeat colonoscopy every five to 10 years. Now, if you have a first degree relative with colorectal cancer, so again, a parent, a child, or a sibling with colorectal cancer, um, you should consider starting colonoscopy at age 40 or 10 years before the earliest diagnosis of colorectal, can colorectal cancer and repeating colonoscopy uh, every five years. So uh, that will uh, conclude the talk uh, today. And so today, hopefully, we've given you a good overview of colorectal cancer epidemiology, the risk factors for colorectal cancer, and methods for colorectal cancer screening as well as also how to apply these colorectal cancer screening recommendations uh, for high-risk individuals. Um, so I'd just like to really thank you for your uh, attention today. This is an incredibly important topic, uh, one again that I'm very passionate about. Um, and uh, I'd just like to highlight here our program's website um, where we have other information about high-risk gastrointestinal uh, cancer syndromes that may potentially be of interest. And I know that we uh, have uh, plenty of time uh, to answer at least some of the questions uh, that, that, that have been sent in or, or were sent in. And so um, I guess we can use the remaining time to go through all of those. But thank you again for uh, uh, listening today. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Katona, for a very informative presentation. And we do have a number of questions that the audience has asked that we do want to address. So the first one um, is a two-part question, and it is, how often should colon cancer screening be performed in BRCA1 and BRCA2 car carriers, and when should screening begin? And is colonoscopy the preferred method of colon cancer screening? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and, and that's probably one area where I see the biggest uh, misperceptions, um, and that's with regard to colon cancer risk in BRCA1 and 2 carriers. Um, in fact, and I, I briefly highlighted this uh, during the presentation, but BRCA1 and 2 carriers really should be screened as if they are at average risk of col colorectal cancer. We don't think that the gene itself uh, substantially increases colorectal cancer risk. Um, and so, yeah, we, we see plenty of BRCA1 and 2 carriers who have been getting screened much, much more aggressively. And while, you know, screening, of course, is a good thing, uh, we don't want to overdo it because there are small uh, risks associated with screening. And so, um, you know, of course, it's a good thing to do, but uh, if it's not needed, you certainly would want to avoid those avoid those risks. So for BRCA1 and 2 carriers, I really do not use the gene mutation at all in figuring out the age to start colonoscopy or colon cancer screening. So if there's no family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, uh, these individuals really should start at, at the same time as individuals at average risk, which nowadays would be uh, at about age 45 as that, as that number has been coming down. Um, and then, you know, um, as far as what is the preferred method of colon cancer screening in BRCA1 and 2 carriers, you know, again, I, I, I can't hide my bias. I'm a gastroenterologist, so I think that the colonoscopy is best because it really allows us to uh, remove polyps, um, uh, find polyps and remove them all, all in the same uh, exam. However, for BRCA1 and 2 carriers, if there's no family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, really I think any of the screening methods are, are okay. And so if you, you know, have a strong aversion to colonoscopy, then you could consider a stool-based test or a uh, CT colonography. Excellent, thank you. That was a very thorough answer. Um, and so building off of BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers, our next question wants to ask, which gene mutations are most at risk for developing colon cancer and how do you get your provider to provide testing? Yeah, so that's also, that's also a great question. Um, you know, so, so I think really the, the biggest risk factor for, biggest hereditary risk factor for colon cancer is uh, Lynch syndrome. 
I did touch on that a little bit again in, in the talk as well. Uh, Lynch syndrome is actually incredibly common. Uh, it's thought that about one in 270 individuals uh, will have Lynch syndrome, uh, meaning that within the United States, there's probably about 1.1 million individuals with Lynch syndrome, although the, the vast majority of individuals with Lynch syndrome do not actually know that they have the diagnosis. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, your provider to uh, provide testing for these, you know, I, I will say that, you know, genetic testing in and of itself is, is becoming increasingly uh, easy to do and is definitely becoming much, much cheaper. And so we've seen a lot of people who have, um, you know, family, concerning family histories that five or 10 years ago, genetic testing may have been out of the question. Uh, but now it's it's very reasonable to test these individuals, and so I think, you know, basically just bringing up the uh, bringing this conversation up with your physician is a great way to go about it. Um, oftentimes, primary care physicians will will refer patients who want testing uh, to a her, a cancer genetics program, which I think is a is a good way to get the testing done. As I do think that getting testing done with the assistance of a licensed uh, genetic counselor really is, is the way to go um, so that you fully understand the type of testing that you're undergoing. And also uh, it will allow you to uh, potentially customize what type of testing uh, you really want to get done. Um, but you know, certainly if you have a family history of, 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 of early colon cancer or you personally have had 10 or more colon uh, polyps that have been removed or if you have had you know, people with young onset age of colon cancer before age 50, I think it's certainly very worthwhile to uh, reinitiate this discussion with your provider uh, to uh, talk about whether or not maybe updated testing, uh, you know, would be a, a good thing for you. Or if you've never had testing, uh, whether test now is the time to consider testing. Excellent. Um... We did have, there, there is this question that keeps popping up here on our question chat, um, and that kind of piggybacked off of discussing Lynch syndrome, and that is this specific person is has Lynch syndrome and it's screening annually, and they want to know if there are any risks associated with screening that often. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, so yeah, with Lynch syndrome, our interval for for colon cancer screening is always very short. Um, and, and the reason that interval is very short in Lynch syndrome is not necessarily because we expect a lot of polyps to form. It's because the, the transition from a small little polyp to a very aggressive cancer can happen incredibly quickly. So normally that transition from a small polyp to a cancer in somebody without Lynch syndrome can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years. In the setting of Lynch syndrome, that transition can happen over the course of one to two years. So it happens much, much more, much, much uh, quicker. Uh, because of that, really, the, the shorter interval of colonoscopy for uh, Lynch syndrome is, is needed. Now, in terms of, you know, are there increased risks associated with, uh, you know, doing the colonoscopies uh, that frequently? You know, I mean, certainly there, there are risks associated with, with colonoscopies. You know, typically we'll quote uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, events or uh, concerning risks in about one to two in a thousand. Um, so overall, though, those risks are, are fairly low, and I think that the benefit of doing colonoscopy and the, the cancer uh, protection that is provided by colonoscopy and Lynch syndrome uh, far outweighs the, the small risks related to the procedures themselves. Thank you. And transitioning from Lynch syndrome, we have some specific questions about the CHECK2 mutation. Um, and so that is, what is the CHECK2 mutation colon cancer risk, and what is the best way to screen for colon cancer in people with the CHECK2 mutation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And you know, as I mentioned in the talk, CHECK2 mutations are incredibly common. We find them in about 1% to 2% of, of all, all individuals. And you know, we really think that, the, that a check, having a CHECK2 mutation confers about a a two-fold increased risk of colorectal cancer. So it's essentially like the equivalent of having a parent or a sibling with, with colon cancer. And so because it does get it to that threshold of actually doubling the colorectal cancer risk, I really think that colonoscopy is, is the best method for, for CHECK2 mutation carriers. 
just as, as is the case for all high-risk uh, uh, colon cancer uh, conditions. And so uh, for CHECK2 mutation carriers, uh, the usual recommendation is to start colon cancer screening at age 40 and to repeat every five years, even if the colonoscopies are completely normal. Okay, and so <clears throat> obviously you have reiterated here that you know colonoscopy would be the preferred method, um, but we do have somebody who's asking if carriers of the MUTYH gene have a different type of screening recommendations. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question, and and um, yeah, METYH is a is a mouthful. It doesn't uh, doesn't roll off the tongue uh, so easily. Um, so this yeah this is, has been an area of controversy. Um, again, as we're testing more and more people, we're learning more and more about carriers of a single copy of these genes, which similar to check two are inc incredibly common. About one to two percent of individuals will actually have one abnormal copy of the METYH gene. But at this point, really, all the data is pointing towards no increased risk of, of, of colorectal cancer in MUTYH uh, carriers. So at, at this point, you know, in the absence of any family history of colon polyps or colon cancer, we really treat these individuals as if they, have had, they are in at average risk. And so really, any of the colon cancer screening methods are really uh, uh, fair game. So I, I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for colonoscopy as strongly in carriers of a single MUTYH gene uh, compared to those who carry a CHECK2 mutation in the absence of a family or personal history of colon cancer or colon polyps. Okay. And so transitioning from talking about beginning screening, we now have somebody who's asking, at what age is it reasonable for a high-risk person to stop undergoing frequent colonoscopies? Yeah, that's a that's a uh, a very good very good um, uh, question, and it can oftentimes be a very hard one and a very uncomfortable uh, conversation for patients uh, and their healthcare providers to to broach. Um, usually, in the general population, we definitely say colorectal cancer screening through age 75. Between 76 to 85, it's really individualized. So during those years, you know, if you're 80 years old and you're extremely healthy, you don't have any other medical conditions that, that, are, that are chronic. I mean, really in those cases, I think that continuing screening uh, is, is, is a good thing. However, you know, if you're 80 years old and, you know, you may have another cancer or other serious uh, medical issues, then screening, you know, may, uh, may not be a good um, uh, thing to continue. So it, that decision, you know, after age 75 really has to be made on an individualized basis, taking into account age, um, uh, other health conditions, overall life expectancy, and then overall colorectal cancer risk. I think after age 85, really, you know, it's, 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 it's not really recommended as the harms of screening uh, outweigh the, the potential benefits at that point. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a, a very detailed answer. Um, and so, you know, people want to know, of course, in addition to screening, there are questions about lifestyle and, and what people can do. And you kind of touched on this in your presentation, but I did just want to ask it again, since it has come up a couple times here on the chat, um, for you to just discuss the role of nutrition and diet and how that plays into prevention and any other recommendations, especially with a view on increased intestinal permeability, um, or those who have other risk factors like diverticulitis, um, how does lifestyle management play into risk factors? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a, that's a really important topic. And, and you know, lifestyle factors uh, can, can alter colon cancer risk by, by small amounts. And so each one in and of themselves, you know, doesn't do a whole lot to alter your risk, but combined, uh, all the lifestyle factors can, together can you know, can make a big can make a big difference, and so and we talked a little bit earlier about you know red meat and processed foods, um, uh, you know being overweight, uh, smoking. Those are all things that can alcohol use can substantially increase your your colorectal cancer risk, especially if you do all of them uh, together. Whereas um, you know physical activity, diet higher high in fiber with fruits and vegetables and dairy can certainly decrease risk, um, and I think that. Um, you know, again, all these change, all these lifestyle factors make make small changes, 
But when you compare them to some of the bigger genetic risk changes, um, you know, sometimes they pale in comparison. So, you know, somebody with Lynch syndrome, although they, you know, don't eat any, um, you know, of the, of the wrong foods, they don't smoke, they don't drink, you know, they exercise all the time, you know, they're, they're helping their colon cancer risk, but it still doesn't obviate the need for colon cancer screening. Um, and these individuals can still uh, develop colorectal cancer. Uh, now, I know you had mentioned uh, some uh, question about uh, leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And uh, this is a topic uh, where it's, it's, it's thought that um, kind of how, how leaky the, the lining of the, the colon or the gut is may affect uh, other things that are going on throughout your body in terms of inflammation or maybe other cancer risk. And, you know, I think that uh, this is really a, a still a very abstract concept uh, that we are, need to learn more about. Um, and we really, at this point, can't make any definitive uh, recommendations about that. But it's something, it's an interesting area of research that's, that's ongoing and uh, certainly we'll, we'll have more uh, to show down the road. Along these lines, you know, I think the microbiome is another interesting area of, of research and how that affects colon cancer risk. The microbiome, for those who aren't familiar, are the billions and billions of bacteria that live inside your large intestine or your, your colon. Uh, these these um, uh, bacteria live in all of us, and they have, they've been associated with all kinds of different diseases um, and cancer risks and other things. However, you know, at this point, we still don't know if it's actually, if this is a, a true cause and effect, so the actual bacteria are, are doing things in the body that are causing certain uh, cancers and other conditions, or if this is merely an association. So these are, these are exciting areas where there's uh, active research. Uh, we're doing a lot of this uh, research uh, uh, in, in the high-risk populations here at Penn, uh, but it's really being done at centers uh, throughout the world. Very exciting area. Wonderful. That is very exciting news. Thank you for sharing that with our constituents. Um, and so we we have time for one more question here. And I, I think after our presentation today, there are probably many people who, you know, wish that they could be one of your patients, but not everybody has access to be close to Philadelphia or Penn Medicine. So we do have people asking, you know, if you could provide guidance on criteria to look for questions to ask. Um, when trying to select a physician or facility to perform high quality screening colonoscopies? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question and, and, and an important one. Um, you know, I always use the analogy like if you're, you know, if, you're, if you're going to buy a car, you know, of course you don't go to one place and buy the first one you see. You, you, know, you look around and you, and you compare. And I think that the same uh, mantra really should apply for, for, for physicians. Um, you know, in terms of uh, 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 quality, I think that there are, you know, two quality metrics that I had mentioned during the talk, I think, are really critical. Um, and one is the, the adenoma detection rate. And so this is the percentage of average risk individuals that the endoscopist is, is finding a precancerous polyp. And there are thresholds in place that, that if you look at a kind of a, a cumulative adenoma detection rate, you want that to be over 25%, meaning that the endoscopist will find a precancerous polyp in one in four patients that he or she is doing a colonoscopy on. That risk can differ a little bit for men and women. For men, it's supposed to be over 30%, women over 20%, because men form polyps uh, more frequently than women. Uh, but in general, if you're looking for a kind of a, a global adenoma detection rate, uh, you want that over 25%. And, and that's totally okay to ask your, your physician uh, who's doing your procedure what their adenoma detection rate is, because we certainly uh, are all, uh, or we certainly should be uh, all uh, tracking this number. The other one is the withdrawal time. And this is, is again, when, you're, uh, when we look for polyps, we basically do it on the withdrawal. So we, doing colonoscopy, we, we go as fast as we can uh, to the end of the colon uh, called the cecum. And then we slowly, slowly, slowly withdraw all the way back through the colon to look, uh, look for polyps on the way back. Um, this withdrawal time, uh, the longer the better. And there's a quality metric that it should be at least over six minutes um, as opposed to under six minutes. So you can imagine if somebody um, spent two minutes looking at your colon compared to spending 12 minutes looking at your colon, it's likely that the individual who spent 12 minutes looking at your colon is going to find more precancerous polyps than the individual that spent two minutes. 
And so I think looking at looking uh, at physician withdrawal time is is another important metric. And then finally, the the last two things I will or last thing that I will uh, note, and this this isn't really uh, pertinent to uh, specific uh, practices, uh, but when if you are going to go for a colonoscopy, it's really important that that you make sure that the prep that you're doing and that the prep is actually adequate for the endoscopist to, to visualize everything. So having a prep that is poor, where there may be some stool still in the colon, really limits our ability to visualize the lining of the colon and can certainly lead to polyps being, being missed during the exam. And so, you know, wherever you do get your colonoscopy, if you go that route, you know, I would make sure to, to follow the directions uh, uh, very, very closely that are provided to you with regard to the prep. And for individuals who may have a history of, of chronic constipation, uh, you know, I would actually recommend speaking to the gastroenterologist and or your primary care doctor about that beforehand because individuals with chronic constipation sometimes need a little bit extra prep to ensure that their prep is adequate to allow for a high quality exam. So I would definitely make sure to take that opportunity, um, you know, if that is your, your case clinically, uh, to speak with the, the gastroenterologist or primary care. Excellent. Well, that is going to wrap our Q&A discussion. Um, and on behalf of everybody at FORCE and all of our attendees today, um, we just want to thank you very much, Dr. Katonia, for such an informative presentation um, oh, and also sure. providing very thorough and complete answers to all of our questions. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, this is a really, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this talk and I hope, hope that it was useful for, for everybody who's listening. It absolutely was. And for everybody who asked the question, yes, the session is being recorded um, and you will receive, since you registered for the event, a recording in 24 hours linked in an email. We will also be posting the recording to the FORCE website as well for future access. Um, and so just before we wrap here, we just want to give our sponsors just one more thank you for bringing this programming to you. Um, please continue to reach out to FORCE for your support and information needs. While there are many mutations and many cancers, this is there is just one community, um, and that is our force community that supports anyone who is impacted by them. Thank you so much for attending, and good night, everyone.